We're going to go ahead and get started now. Thanks very much, everyone, for joining us at this uh, our first webinar here at the Center for Environmental Farming Systems. My name is Steve Moore, and joining me from Ohio is Natalie Bumgarner, who is a uh, doctoral student, and we also have Andy Pressman, a educator in high tunnels and a farmer from Pennsylvania who represents NCAT Natra. He'll be answering your questions that you type in so that I can keep progressing with the body of the presentation and kind of keep me on pace as well. Uh, you'll notice the sign-ups there for the, or the phone numbers for the other questions. I want to just explain briefly what the uh, center is. Our mission is to develop and promote agricultural systems that protect the environment, enhance rural and urban communities, and provide economic opportunities to North Carolina and beyond. The mechanics of the webinar if you're a first time Weber, uh, please hit the green check mark. It's in the bottom right hand corner under participants. That helps us to get a snapshot of the group that we're looking at. So about half of you roughly are the first time here. Uh, it's my first time broadcasting, so I think we'll have some fun and go through that. As I mentioned, Andy Pressman will moderate and address any of your questions. If you fall out of audio contact, uh, indicate to Amber and she can help you gain that back. This will be recorded for later use. And feel free to use the emoticons on the bottom left to help guide me as I try to look into the group and see what we're up to. Because the group, uh, we had 250 sign up, and so we're using a non-audio on your part components because it would get kind of crazy answering everybody's questions. But we hope to do that over the chat session, and you can certainly contact me uh, through my email address uh, and to go through any of the other problems or concerns you might have. So let's see how, who we have in our group and see what we can do to join us. Um, how many of you are farmers? If you would check the green box. Great. So we have, um, we have good many farmers here. That's great. How many of you have high tunnels? Great, great. That's good to know, too. And how many of you have used inner covers before? Now I really wish this was interactive, because I imagine among the several dozen that responded yes, uh, we could get a real good discussion going. And maybe sometime we can uh, work on that as well. How many are extension educators? Check mark, please. OK. Just a few. Great. So it's a, a farmer dominant group. I'm excited about that. Uh, I'm going to be presenting two different uh, locations. One is our farm in southeastern Pennsylvania, which is a U USDA Zone 6. And the other group of information will be from CEFS at Goldsboro in North Carolina. And that will represent a USDA Zone 8 in the coastal plains. Sorry. The agenda for the day, we're going to introduce, have an, this introduction, look over the inner covers, thermal performance, transplant production under inner covers, crop production within inner covers, construction details, and the cost. And then Natalie will present some information uh, from her work in Ohio 
that's actually being presented by her mentor uh, in Portugal at the, uh, today as well. We'll have a little time for question and answer, hopefully. For those of you who are new to the greenhouse and high tunnel, inner tunnel, low tunnel uh, discussion, a high tunnel is an unheated and non-mechanically ventilated greenhouse frame. An inner cover is a low tunnel within the high tunnel. Those are not hard and fast definitions. Some people call them hoop houses and so forth, but it gives us a frame of reference. There are th three ways that we heat with the un, uh, these non-mechanically heated. We have the solar, of course, which has considerations. We have the ambient heat of the earth, which varies quite a bit across the country. For uh, me currently in eastern North Carolina, we have a constant temperature of 64 at 8 feet down. In our farm in Pennsylvania, we have a constant temperature of about 55. So depending on where you vary, it gives you an idea of what you have to work with. And then, uh, not to be uh, discounted, is the thermal decay of a highly organic soil. In a more temperate climate, like in Pennsylvania, accumulation of a soil OM is fairly easy to accomplish. As you move into the hot and humid south, it is tough to keep uh, any amount of soil organic matter in the soil to add that amount of uh, thermal uh, sourcing. So I'm going to talk about two kinds of layouts that I've used over the years. I've had about uh, 20 years of experience in high tunnel production. One is called the lateral beds, and you can see they run the whole length of the greenhouse or high tunnel with five foot wide beds, and uh, each bed is covered with a single uh, covering. Another style that I adopted was a lateral layout, or, or I'm sorry, a key bed type layout in which you had a center aisle in the high, tun high tunnel as shown in the picture with a 20 foot, uh, it's a 30 foot, excuse me, 30 foot wide high tunnel, and the beds on the left are about 14 feet uh, long, allows you to walk down a center aisle and then duck into the uh, little lateral beds. It increases the production area about 5% in the greenhouse. Does a couple extra things. It also allows you to have a center uh, garden hose that you can run up and down rather than having to flip-flop hoses back and forth if you do any of the initial watering with a, with a garden hose type setup. It also allows workers to work in those lateral beds and for the flow of either product or materials as you bring in compost to happen down the main aisle. You don't have to walk over top of people as you're uh, in a lateral bed where you have to go all the way to the end to change around. Here's a combination in the, on the right hand side you see the uh, lateral beds and on the left the key beds. And we're going to talk a good bit more about those in terms of construction and performance. Notice over here um, where we have a um, you see a little dot up there. That is the cover completely rolled back. That's tracked on a set of swaged pipes with a handle over at the end over here. And, and that will allow you to uh, roll it up manually and close it up. So looking at those various types of inner covers, and I know many of you have uh, your own designs and so forth, but f these in terms of lateral beds, uh, this is what we found. This is the three cold consecutive nights in March. And uh, this was several years ago. You can look um, in the, uh, the outside. Uh, we actually, actually, I have to say this slide is completely flipped around. 
and I'm going to have to apologize for that and move to a little different slide to show the same sort of thing. But what this allows a person, uh, when you look at the data from this, this uh, night's um, viewing of the temperatures, in this particular day represented right over here, we had a moderate day and then it dipped very cold. Uh, this is the, uh, it should be the flip of this chart here. It dipped very cold to 14 degrees at night, but with the inside plastic, uh, it helped to moderate the temperature. As you move to the AM cell, it did a better job, and to the foil, it even did a better job of retaining the heat overnight. So a really cold night, uh, we were allowed to carry some of the heat into the next night where you still see a pretty good divergence of temperatures. And I have a slide that will much better uh, at showing that. Here is a diagram of what it might look like in a high tunnel for a configuration of the, the long uh, beds of the high tunnel and also for the key type. Notice a couple things that we've learned over the years to magnify the, the three heat sources that we have. A thermal barrier to isolate away from the cold ground rigid foam to do the same. What we're really trying to do is uh, tap, type into this, tap into this really um, significant amount of earth heat down below in here and capture it and be able to allow it to slowly drift up into the plants. And then the inner covers keep some of the heat down and the outer covers, of course, make a second blanket. So I asked myself with this performance, what can I do to synergize these inner and outer covers? I know that as an objective, I need to maximize my light uh, every end, knowing that every layer of plastic reduces light transmission about 8%, and I need to reduce my heat loss at night. And those were the two things I had to make some combination of inner and outer covers to make that work. So I formed a hypothesis on our farm, and that was that if I use a single very clear and strong outer layer, because part of that uh, double outer layer is not only thermal performance, but also it allows some strength to the plastic so it doesn't flap and, and lose its transmissivity or simply lose it off the structure. And you'll notice the picture on the right, I've compensated for um, not having a uh, two layers to give me that cushion against the wind by putting in a strap in there uh, right in through here and a little crossbar to support that right in here. And that helps just like you would if you were putting a load on a truck. It helps to, to hold the tarp down, if you will, in several locations. The kind of plastic I chose for that uh, was uh, the Coeva from Italy. Uh, it has a 7.8 mil. It has a life expectancy of eight years. It has, uh, as I mentioned, a great bit, of, uh, a larger degree of transmissivity, and it is an IR film. They use a boron and phosphorus compound to re-radiate the infrared radiation. And I thought, my thinking is it's going to give me more light during the day, and um, I'll try to trap it lower at night, the heat. And then correspondingly with an inner cover, I used more thermal retentive inner cover at night, and thinking I'd get more light, meeting my objectives, get more light during the day because of the single layer, and, have, and put more money uh, into the inner covers to retain the heat close to the plant. 